Welcome to Meet the Biz. <laughs> Today we have, uh, talk about a disability rights advocate. He is autistic reality. I first met this amazing man in New York for a gathering for uh, Harry Hartman Squire's Lights, Camera, Access 2.0. And he is, he's just amazing. What can I say? Mr. Alec Frazier! Yeah. Yay! <laughs> hey. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, how are you? Good. You look wonderful. Uh well, uh you know, I've been working very hard. Uh, I figure with this virus going on, uh, I want to keep busy so that I don't think about, you know, bad stuff. And I've been successful at that, by the way. I'm, I'm, you know, just staying very positive and hopeful, which I know is tough during these times. But I had, um, if you if you'd like me to explain, I had a. Uh, um, an aha moment about eight years ago where I chose, I, I'm, I'm not recommending this to anyone else. I don't know how it worked, but I chose uh, to not to get depressed or seriously sad anymore. And uh, for some stupid reason it worked and I haven't been depressed or seriously sad in eight years. I love that. And how do you, how, how for, for people that would, for people who are going through that, who, who get on the edge of maybe being depressed, what, how would you say to help them to get over that or get through it? Well, for one thing, uh, one thing, I have a very strict rule, unless it's like the moment I'm voting in a primary or general election, I never post politics to my personal wall. And I have two business pages and I only post good news there or here's how to fix this problem. Um, I recognize that in the world of disability advocacy, there are a lot of eh, unfortunate things happening, but everybody else is posting about that. I want to post about the good stuff because I noticed that there's a, there's a lack of that online, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I remember the first time I met you, which uh, you you have you have this power about you this this thing about you where you're you, you people don't forget you you have this magic about you and I, I met you at the uh, Terry Hartman Squires Lights Cameras Action 2.0 in New York. Yeah, Lights Camera Access 2.0. The one in New York I was actually co-hosting by accident. Uh, J.D. Michaels, who was my partner at work at the time, was hosting the, the uh, uh, seminar that time. Was, was it that one or the one that the, was the one at BBDO or the one at JCC? God, I'm blanking. I know it was in April 2018. Yeah, the, geez, I, I don't know. Well, there was one I, that I was the JD co-hosted at BBDO where he was working at the time. And uh, I was one of his fellows uh, for his, uh, for his pro his program at the time. And I ended up accidentally co-hosting that one. Mm -hmm. The one in, in uh, the other one at the, I think it was the JCC. I was, uh, I was one of the speakers, the panelists. Right. Um, yeah. Right. Well, I, I mean, I was l looking through your website and, and all the stuff that you do. I mean, it's like, oh, I mean, you're constantly yeah. working. You'll, the website is good. Even better are the two Facebook pages. There's the Facebook page for Autistic Reality, where I talk about disability advocacy and political issues. And then there's the one uh, that's named after my book. Vaini Vidi Autism, 
and and that is uh, and except it doesn't have exclamation points. It has commas, veiny exclu and the veiny comma vd comma autism, and that and that one is where where I cover my uh, publication and my uh, entertainment news. And I uh, this time last year, I was at New York Comic Con, and I uh, I had some friends who were already in the pop culture criticism world, and they said, don't go to them, they'll come to you. Well, I learned early on that nobody's gonna come to you unless you make yourself heard. So I, it's so funny, some of the biggest names, I I got Diana Gabaldon, the author of Outlander, by literally, uh, uh, I emailed her, but she didn't answer that. So I, but but I did post a copy of the email I sent her, um, on my Facebook page and tagged her in it and she actually responded within five minutes and said sure I'll sit down with you you know and uh, and a few years prior I was uh, I you see my what my first master's paper which was my master's in disability studies from uh, from uh, uh, the University of Buffalo uh, I loved the degree. The advisor didn't always have the best advice. So I, I did a paper on the first autistic superhero from Marvel Comics, uh, Tim Burke as the second Daredevil. And, uh, and then I, uh, and then I uh, asked him, I did the paper and I asked, can I publish this? And he said, not unless you do a lot of work. And then I said, can I monetize it? And he laughed at me. Uh -huh. well, I went, I went, this was my academic advisor, to be fair. Right. He, he was, he was thinking along academic lines, but I went to the guy who ran, this is the issue, by the way. Character is revealed to have autism. I, I keep this framed in under glass. Oh, wow. So, um, and then I, uh, uh, no, no, he's revealed as that character. The brilliant thing about the writer is he never actually discussed on the uh, uh, in the comic. He never mentioned the autism because you know I, I, I'm Alec Frazier and I don't scream. I have autism every time I go around in public. I just I did that's not who I who I am all the time. It, it's a facet of life. It's not the entire thing. So, uh, but yeah, the writer confirmed that. And uh, confirmed. Somebody asked, and he he confirmed. And uh, and when the character was revealed, was in that issue. So I went to the guy at the local comic book shop in Buffalo, New York, where I was living at the time, and he actually helped me get some illustrations and get the paper published oh. as a uh, little pamphlet-sized thing, like 15 pages or so. Yeah. I did a uh, a. Uh, uh, I sold it at regional comic cons and networked the hell out of it, gave copies to people. And I tried to in talk about, talk to the writer who was uh, comics writer, Brian Michael Bendis. He's a big, big name and it was impossible to reach him, but I was planning on going to Fan Expo in Toronto um, in 2016 anyway, uh, so that I could meet Stan Lee. And I did. And uh and uh, and I gave him a copy of of uh, of this, and uh, he said I'll read it when I get home. And uh, and uh, then I, I before I continue on that story, a few years later, JD gave a copy of this to Stan's manager, and Stan's manager gave it to Stan, and it was probably the last gift Stan received before he died. Oh, wow. So. Uh, um, so, uh, well, you have these amazing connections. I mean, yeah, you are such a strong advocate for the community, and you you do it through so many different ways. You do it through public speaking, and you do it through through art and writing. Well, you know, I, I a lot of people think art, and they think art and artistic stuff. And I love Terry Harmon Squire. She's like an aunt to me by now. But the thing is that uh, she's lately been focusing on visual and performing art. And literature is a very valid art. 
I mean, you know, you, yeah. you go here in D.C. and, and you, if, if you visit and they're finally open and quarantine's finally over, I will take you to become a reader at the Library of Congress and you will see this beautiful temple, the Jefferson Building they've constructed with, with, to literature. It's, it's amazing. Literature is about art. Back to my story, F Fan Expo 2016. I was unable to get in touch with Brian Michael Bendis, but I learned that Joe Quesada, the creative head of Marvel, was holding a meet and greet for like $50, $75. You could get some stuff signed by him and ask him some Q&A. And, and I said, well, if I can't get Bendis to answer me, I'll go to his boss. <laughs> and, so I, uh, and so I did not just meet Joe Casada, but I formed a friendship with him. We're friends on Facebook, and he and if I message him, he will eventually get back to me. Um, and at uh, New York Comic Con last year, this time last year, which was the biggest Comic Con in human history at that point, I uh, I actually uh, was Joe invited me to VAP attendance at his. Uh, at his big panel and uh, where he interviewed uh, Vincent D'Onofrio. Yeah. And, uh, and then afterwards, we both walked to the show floor and he uh, stood there answering my questions for my podcast and my YouTube channel for like 15 minutes. And at one point they said, Joe, you really need to do the company podcast. And he's like, no, I want to talk to Alec instead, you know, so. There you go. That was, uh, yeah. I love too you know. that, uh, you know, I mean, you're talk about all these people and Lieutenant Uhura, correct? Yeah. You're, you're, she, she wrote uh, for your, your website. She didn't, she didn't write that, but I met her uh, about six years ago and she indicated through her agent that she wanted to endorse me and that she wanted, she, uh, back then, I only had uh, this book, the pamphlet, and uh, and uh, I gave her a copy, and uh, I got a photo with her, and she signed a book of mine, and uh, and she and her agent said, "We'll give you Michelle Nichols' endorsement." Yeah, and yeah, what a wonderful endorsement! I mean, especially to have that one of the beginning quote, uh, the seeds, the founders, in a way, uh, of, of Star Trek. I mean, yeah. it's great. Yeah, um, that was very cool. I, I have a, 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 an outstanding promise from Anthony Rapp, who is Lieutenant Paul Stamets in Star Trek Discovery and is a big name in diversity and entertainment because his character was the first uh, gay character in a Star Trek series. And, uh, and so uh, they unfortunately waited until that series, you know, but, but yeah. So, or at least to announce it, right? Oh, oh yeah. He, he's very out and very open. Plus I, I have to give him, him mad props for his courage. He's the one who uh, he was, on the receiving end of some sexual assault by Kevin Spacey back in the eighties. And he's the one who outed Kevin Spacey as a sexual predator. Yeah. So he, I mean, uh, and in the full uh, honesty, I have to say me too, you know, me, so uh, it's not just, you know, women and uh, small guys. I'm six foot five, 280 pounds. And it's, you know, but uh, but uh, he has agreed to sit with me at at some point. And uh, but right now they're, I think today they actually have their Star Trek Universe panel at the now online New York Comic Con. But I went to the physical one last year. Wow. And, uh, well, I tell you, you uh, I can't wait till the pandemic is over. So whenever you are in. Los Angeles, you'll have to come visit Meet, meet the Biz and I, our I, I don't, I, I'm working on a very limited budget, less than shoestring, you know, so unless I get someone to sponsor me, 
Um, you know, I can I can go to New York City. It's like round trip. It, it trip. It's like a fifty dollar train ticket, and then uh, a couple dozen dollars for for an Airbnb. You know. Have, but, you, ever uh, been, have you ever worked in California? Uh, I, I did attend a event for what was then called USBLN, which is now called uh, Disability Inn. And I, I prefer USBLN, honestly. And uh, JD, who has been in advertising for decades, also thinks that that's better than Disability Inn, you know. And so, uh, uh, so I was in, I was on their youth advisory committee for for two and a half years and one of their meetings was in LA and I did that but what wasn't going to be business you'll actually find the whole last unit of this book is writings relating to fandom of James Cameron's avatar and you see I actually uh, got we got a very rare thing that like never happened before. We, the the official fan group for James Cameron's Avatar, which is called Avatar Meet, got an invite to the studio, right? And met with a lot of the special effects people and product people, production people and staff people, and uh, and um, I actually asked uh, producer John Lando, who's, I mean, James Cameron is the guy whose name is on it. But yeah. John Lando does all the grunt work and he's maybe the busiest guy in the movie making business because, you know, he was behind like uh, Titanic and, and half of the Terminator and Alien sequels and, right. you know, and, and Avatar and Alita Battle Angel and endless stuff like that. And he, uh, and he, I asked him what, what he thought was, his thoughts were on, and I'm pointing this carefully, I said featuring people with disabilities in the future films right. and his answer was very smart he he was very wise he was so wise Th this was like a trick question and i didn't even know it he said you see i really get concerned when i hear the word featuring because that means you're making a special interest case out of it ah. and and that in and that as you know as a disability advocate involves pity and you're, you, you don't want that. You want to show these people living their lives as they naturally do. If the, uh, of course, that would include disabled characters, LGBTQ characters, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, uh, they have more than one disabled actor working on the sequels. And well, you, you know C.J. Jones, yes? Yes, that's him. That's yes. Yes. And uh, Have you interviewed and, him yet? No, but I, I'm looking to do that. I, I'm looking to connect with him, honestly. Yeah. Um, I haven't ever, I, I saw him when he was at a Ruderman Foundation panel, but I don't think he's ever met me in person. Yeah. I'd love to interview him, to tell the truth. You know, if you right. could help with that, maybe. Oh, I would be, love you know, to. I, I, you know, I will definitely connect the two of you because I think it would be a great connection, especially since you are so into the, the, um, the, the comic books and the avatar and, and, yeah. and the creative writing and film. Now, this is not just, I, I do things for my YouTube and I do things for my podcast. There's like uh, uh, three dozen uh, 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 podcast entries. Some of the podcast entries are also YouTube uh, now with the advent of Zoom, the quarantine has actually been really wonderful me for me because it forced me to innovate and I've been able to uh, use Zoom to record interviews on video. And now I have video interviews that I never would have had before. Isn't and so, great? yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and so, uh, and I also got a Zoom account, which is like negligent negligible price yeah. you know for for what you get and uh and i uh i have so i have my youtube my podcast but i also write for uh publications i write uh for flickering myth which is a website a pop culture website um like i did there i did a whole uh my first piece for them was an essay on how alita battle angel was basically it was a fantasy come true for people with prosthetics because almost every character in that film 
is to some degree or another prosthetic. And it's interesting that the most human character in the film, her only human part is, is I think, her brain, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, and uh, there are people with fake arms who use them for, for uh, as an advantage playing, playing music. There are people who use them as sports advantage. And you realize that everybody in that film, almost everybody at least, is physically disabled in some way but it's not a disability. It's it, they use it for like superhuman abilities, you know. Yeah. And and so I wrote a piece on that for them. I wrote their uh, their uh, review of Love Victor. I did an interview with. I I, I actually met Becky Al Albertalli, who wrote Love Victor and Love Simon. Um, she was coming to speak at a local uh, independent bookstore. And I uh, uh, and I met with her and I gave her a copy of my book and she signed some copies of her book for me and she agreed to do an interview with with me and uh, so um, then I also do a lot of work for Starburst magazine. Do you know who they are? I uh, no, but w w now when did they it, become? Starburst Star. magazine ha is like the oldest and the biggest sci-fi and action magazine. Um, they they're British and they've been around since the seventies. They are so highly regarded that they are to science fiction, action, comics, and horror as uh, Rolling Stone is to music. I love so, this. so yeah, and I I've written reviews and uh uh. uh and uh, blurbs, they do. They, they've used the quarantine as an advantage to finally do like hundred best science fiction films. And I re did many reviews of a couple films for them. They also did uh, biggest horror moments. Um, I have my first full size interview coming out for them. When well, I have uh, to ask you, you mentioned horror moments. What is your favorite? If you had to choose a, your favorite horror film of all time. No, I, I think with horror, that's the wrong way to view it. Scariest horror. Oh, okay. I, I if you are in a dark room watching for the very first time and paying rapt attention to the 1983 film Ghost Story, it will be the scariest shit you'll ever see. I love that film. Alice Cridge, right? Yeah, Cridge, yes. Cridge. She, no I, one is scarier than her. Ah. Oh. She's so brilliant. Yeah. I would love to meet her. Oh. Yeah. She is amazing. And, uh, of course, naturally, they got her to play the the recur recurring role of the Borg Queen in Star Trek. You know? Oh, yeah. 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 Know. yeah. And so, uh, th sh no, one does, no one can do frightening like her. I tell you, I mean, uh, when I was growing up, and still, once in a while, but I collect one of my things was collecting soundtrack albums and one of my favorite genres was quote horror just because the music is so old and i actually yeah. have the soundtrack on lp of ghost story oh great yeah um so i i did that and so i have this in i like i said i one way i connect with these famous like filmmakers and comic book people Dude, I just drop him a friend request on Facebook, and you'd be surprised who answers. Yeah. So what, one of the people who answered uh, a couple years ago was Dacre Stoker, who's the great-grandnephew of Bram Stoker, and he's also Bram Stoker's literary executor. And wow. he has written, because he has the rights to the estate, he has actually written the official prequel and sequel to Dracula, officially licensed. And he also gives tours of, of course, once again, when we're not on quarantine, he gives tours of Vlad, Vlad Tepes's uh, Romania, you know, Vlad the Impaler, who Dracula's based on. And uh, and actually, I there's a site called Mini Museum, and I recently ordered some soil from one of Vlad Tepes's castles, and I'm having Dacre sign it and send it back. <laughs> And uh, and so Dacre agreed to be in an interview with me 
uh, he hey, he's all about getting the word out, you know. So, so that will be a sizable interview I've got going in Starburst. And if you have like a place, a news shop bigger than a newsstand, but like a news shop that sells reputable magazines, or if you have a Starburst sub subscription, that should be coming out a couple days before Halloween this month. Oh my God, this sounds great. Um, what is, question, what is one of your biggest joys? Photography. I, I live in a town that is filled with monuments, memorials, museums of all kinds. And I want to, uh, not just disability access, I know there that the majority of people in this country do not even leave their home state in their entire life. Yeah. I want to create an online database of photos of sites that people can uh, see. And dude, even when I go to like an, a restaurant, like I went to an Ethiopian restaurant the, the, a few days ago and I took photos of my meal, you know? And, uh, and then I, I, because I have OCD, I make that work for me instead of being a hindrance. So I like thoroughly subcategorize uh, all the albums by like place and, and then, uh, and, and stuff like that. And, uh, and uh, I uh, was in the middle of photographing the brand new state-of-the-art paleontology hall right. at the Smithsonian right, right when the quarantine hit. And I'm waiting for it to open again um, so that uh, most of the Smithsonians are having limited openings right, right. now. Right. So, well, yeah. you know, I was, again, doing research on you. And, and of course, I met you in, in, in New York. But you do public speaking event management, social networking, you, you're a content editor. What do you, what do you like to do the most? What do you I like? haven't done, I haven't done event management in a few years, to be honest. I should probably take that off there. But what, what do I like doing the most? This is going to sound like cliche and it's going to sound fake, but I get a big rush a big amount of pride and joy out of helping people. For yeah. example, I have a friend named Carrie and in March or April, Carrie got COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, the president said, don't be afraid of it. Carrie is on oxygen probably for the rest of her life due to it. And she's running the risk of losing multiple toes and at least one finger. Uh, and, uh, and she's uh, like, thoroughly disabled for the rest of her life. And so um, one thing I do for my friends who deserve rewards or who are going through tough times, I send them four foot pillows. I actually, these big fat things, almost as big as they are. And, and, uh, and Carrie really needed a good pillow. So I sent one to her. And I also sent her a copy of the book. And, uh, and uh, I, I have like no money. But I sent her uh, sizable donations to her medical funds. You know, th this is the big problem we have. She doesn't have, uh, or rather her insurance will not cover fixing her circulation in her hands and feet. Right. So they want to amputate, you know? Right. Uh, That's, it's horrific. I mean, I'm on, I'm on Medicaid myself. Yeah. And, uh, and my dental isn't covered, you know, so, but no. yeah. We have to keep going, don't we? We just have to keep going. And, and what you said about helping people, you know, that is one of my biggest joys is to see the joy that others get and to see last, the effect of that. Yeah. Last year in New York Comic-Con, um, there are other people in the pop culture world who deal with disability and comics and stuff, our friend Day, for example. But unlike Day, uh, I've noticed that Day's work is like really scholarly takes on things, you know? And, and, I, come, and I come, even though I do have a master's in disability studies and an honorary doctorate in counseling, I still, uh, I still uh, you know, uh, I, I still approach it as a fan and I try to make it digestible to the average person. And so we had like 250 people show up to that panel 
and a huge amount of them, rows and rows of autistic people who it, it, they, they, they came to the realization that like a huge percentage of people, endless amounts of people were also autistic people in that audience. And one of them said afterwards, she was in tears and she said, I have never been around so many people like me, you know? Mm. Mm. And that's, uh, the, yeah. Yeah, no, that it's, it's amazing when people do come together, whether it's from different communities or the same community, it's so, that's what we need right now, people coming together than, than building yeah. apart. It's, it's, it's much simpler. It's much and I tried to bring people together from different communities. You know, I, I, uh, I left the disability-only advocacy world a few years ago because I realized that, um, like, for example, there is a certain large autistic self-advocacy organization that is really militant compared to my beliefs and uh, and that operates in a way that is like exclusionary of people who aren't autistic. And I agree that the people, that people with autism are our own best advocates, but I also don't want to throw like parents and teachers and allies off, off of the raft, you know? Yeah. I, I, I think that they're, you know, for example, a parent is much more reason, uh, 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 willing to approach things from an autistic person's point of view if you don't immediately alienate them, you know? Right, right. You, uh, you know, you, uh, here are some words I'm going to throw out to you or, or that you're connected with. Sociology, psychology, yes. public administration, bowling, yes. si uh, sociology of gender. gender. Yes, I uh, big fat class in university that was actually uh, gender, sociology, and pop culture. We studied gender and sexuality through comics, uh, military movies. Uh, we watched Soldier's Girl. Uh, we, we um, uh, hip hop, and what was the fourth one? Uh, oh yeah, vampires. We studied uh, uh, a, an Octavia Butler book. So. Oh my God. You know, you said vampires and it took me to the Magic Castle. Not that they have vampires there, yeah. but have you ever been to the Magic Castle? No, like I said, I wish I could get up to California more, uh, more often, but that is, well, I, I don't have money. You know, so. Well, whenever somebody flies you out to California, yeah, yeah. You, you, uh, let me know because we, you gotta, maybe we'll go together. We'll get a group together yeah. and go to the Magic we Castle. Need to. It's so much fun. Um, I have somebody, somebody, Todd Jenkins wrote on, on, on the Facebook wall because I mentioned that I was interviewing you today. And this is what he wrote, so I'm gonna throw it out. Uh, As a comics buff, what do you think of the representation of autism within the comics industry? Um, what the industry? Yeah, in the, in the industry. And what opportunities might there be for autistic artists and writers in that field? And do you see a resistance to that inclusion within the industry? You know, I will say throughout history, I will say that a lot of the people who are very famous comic book creators have been autistic. It's just, they don't make it a big honking deal about it. And you know, some of it was before diagnosis was commonplace. Some people have chosen not to get common, not to get diagnosis. Uh, some people don't make it a very public thing, but autistic people thrive in that environment. What was it back in the day? It was people sitting in, the, in a cubicle in a bullpen creating their stuff. Like, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry. I know that Alan Moore likes to get pissed off at everybody, but I swear he has autism. There's no way he doesn't, you know? 
the creator of Watchmen, V for Vendetta, and stuff like that. I mean, I mean, just look at his whole public persona. There's no way he doesn't, you know. And and uh, a lot of the other people, you're you're even on the local level, your comic book shop owners and your fans at your conventions, you will find a lot of people either with autism or with family members with autism. And I've actually. One time I was at a show in Rochester, New York, and I was given a small theater to do my presentation in. And usually, it, it, for most panels, it's like three or five people in mm. there. We filled the small theater because we were giving an autism-centric talk, you know, and yeah. uh, autism and creativity, rather. You know, there's a big panel I do, the one I did in New York Comic Con last year. It's autism and... Uh, creativity. I just did a version of it for the National Disability Mentoring Coalition and people with youth with disabilities. And I'm giving it again, this time as a free online seminar for the uh, DC Public Library. And if you think, well, Alec, aren't you giving that everywhere and to everyone? Uh, you know, it, it actually doesn't get easier doing it over and over again. New stuff comes in. And I, I think everybody deserves to hear about that, you know? Yeah. What's your proudest moment in your life? Um, this is going, listen, I need to preface this by saying I have literally gotten a standing ovation from JFK's sister. I have had uh, I have had that talk with Joe Casada where he said you are doing exactly what people with disabilities need to do in order to get noticed in the creative world. You need to actually come to us. You know, I've I've had I've had uh, I I I've had y you know people like that, but that's not my proudest moment. When I was living in Buffalo. The comic book shop owner, Emil Novak Sr., who is the biggest geek I've ever seen, we had just come from a uh, an event at the City Library in, in Buffalo, and we were all at lunch together, and he said, I, I can't believe you're not one of Professor X's gifted mutants, and that, that was the biggest praise I've ever gotten, you know, so... That was yeah. <laughs> that I I mean like like I said I I've got Stan Lee re, who read my books you know but yeah. but but that 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 was actually the biggest praise I've ever gotten the proudest moment in my life I think. We have over a hundred students at Performing Arts Studio West, and then we have I don't know how many from Meet the Biz, as well as this is going to go on YouTube. Um, right. How do people who are interested in comics or, or, or what you do, how do they connect with you? <laughs> I've got a multi-page document of social pro profile links. Uh, best ways are uh, not my personal Facebook page. The, trust me, you know me. I'm, I'm crazy as hell. You know, <laughs> I, 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 and I'm proud of it, too. I'm proud of it too. You have so to be in you might, well. pe people might get weirded out being friends with me on my personal page, but look up autistic reality on Facebook and also look up Vani VD autism on Facebook. That is V E N I comma space V I D I comma space autism. And uh, also uh please go to my website, not just for the website, but it has links to all of my social media profile pages. You'll find a link to my podcast. You'll find a link to my YouTube. These interviews go on, well, not this one, but like the one I'm going to do with you in December, go on there. And, uh, and I've, I also do other fun videos and, uh, and uh, I also have a blog, actually two blogs, um, one is uh, simply the aut Autistic Reality blog where I post personal stuff and disability 
related stuff and random stuff. But the one I'm most proud of is the Baby BD Autism blog, which I really need to post to again, uh, which is where I post my uh, pop culture content. Um, by the way, also, oh, by the way, I yeah? saw your interview with Judy Human. I love that, how you guys were eating and it was just yeah, so was, relaxing yeah. and fun. She she had Stevie, her assistant, go out and buy and buy like cake and uh, and ice cream and and party favors and stuff like that, and 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 I put a banner up behind me that said Happy Birthday, <laughs> and we we just Judy is lovely and uh, uh, I love her to bits. She's amazing, and I had just finished watching Crip Camp when, when for the first time when I saw that, so it was all fresh in my head. Isn't that like yeah. one of the best films ever? I just loved it. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, that was amazing. And then, oh my God, did you see my interview with Tony Coelho? I haven't yet, I have to watch it. Yes, you do, yes, <laughs> you do. You'll also see his letter of reference that he gave me on my website, which yeah. is, extremely humbling that he was willing the he of all people was willing to say that about me um but yeah i did a an interview with him that's on my youtube and uh the audio might be on my podcast but please when given the option between audio and on podcast and youtube video look at the youtube video yeah. like the thing with judy isn't nearly as fun without with, without the, the video i love seeing all the different expressions and the emotions and and the mm, you know <laughs> the eating of the cake yeah. uh yeah thank yeah, you so, uh, yeah no problem no problem this has been this has been a blast yeah and the, the thing is that i uh, here's how i sum this up I know people who are better at disability advocacy than me. I know people who are better at pop culture work than me. But I have yet to meet anybody who combines them quite like me, you know. And and that's not bragging, but that is a genuine fact. I, I, I'm not aware of anyone who does that, you know. <laughs> Something you might want to capture yes. before we leave? Of course. JD and my own career. I have an action figure. Ah! Oh, bring it closer to the camera. Oh my God. That is great. Yeah. Where, did, where did you get it? Well, uh, JD has is a wonderful man. I love him dearly. And he has uh, these contacts. And as you know, I was doing a fellowship for him that was supposed to last a year, but it ended up lasting like almost two years in various ways, shape, and form. And as a gift at the end, he has a friend who scans people for like Hollywood and major, major things. The guy had just gotten done scanning Bill Murray's foot of all things. And he, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, you know, uh, there, there's, there's all sorts of weird stuff going on. So um, he, uh, he actually, they, he stood over me with these capture devices all around my body as I wore the suit and he had the glasses in post, but uh, anyway, they, yeah, so I think if I'm correct, it's made from granulated glass, which means it is so fragile, you know. That's gorgeous. Yeah, and uh, this is, and so one of the questions I answer uh, for the, the pop culture panel JD came up with those questions, and uh, the last one is, what does your action figure look like? And that's the only image in the panel. I just simply roll this image, you know. <laughs>